you have a lot of people calling for a no-fly zone in Ukraine. And when I say a lot of people, actually, what I mean is you, you have uh, a worrying amount of people. They are a minority, but, but just the fact that they're saying this is, is extremely worrying. A no-fly zone, in case you don't know what that is, is uh, basically making sure that, uh, in this case, no Russian planes could fly uh, over Ukrainian skies, right? So if there would be Russian jets, they get shot down. It's basically a way to disable the uh, aerial supremacy or aerial power of another country's uh, conventional armed forces. And look at this. This is Nora O'Donnell. She reports that Senator Romney tells us he would love for there to be a no-fly zone that would allow refugees to escape Ukraine. Quote, it would hopefully be something done by the UN or by NATO or even by us. But we don't want to find ourselves in a position where we're in, we're in direct conflict with Russians. Oh, you don't? Okay, well, then why are you advocating for a no-fly zone? What do you think is going to happen when you shoot down a Russian jet? You think Putin is going to give you vodka and caviar? <laughs> wow. Wow. Now, here is General Sir Richard Barons. He's the ex-head of the Joint Forces Command. And look what he has to say on BBC. No-fly zone. Feasible. So it's, um, it's Monday night. By Wednesday, um, Russian heavy artillery will be around these Ukrainian cities and they may be firing indiscriminately and destroying large chunks of a city and killing civilians. And when they do this, they'll be 300 miles from the border with NATO and the European Union, a day's drive or half an hour in a military jet. So I think one of the issues for about Thursday, Friday this week is how does public opinion in the UK and other countries react to seeing people who look and live like us being slaughtered? And at that Did you hear the sentence again? The, the, the people who look and live like us. What, what does that mean? Like, are you saying people from outside of Europe are animals or something? They don't live like us? What, what, are, you, what are you saying? People who live and look like us. Christ, they just don't stop. Like every single day, there's more of this racist, this overtly racist nonsense. Unbelievable. At that stage, I think there'll be a different conversation led by public opinion about the application of NATO military power, perhaps through the sky and definitely against heavy weapons. I I'm fascinated that you say that because up until now, the opinion one has tended to hear from people in the military and the defense side of politics is that means war with Russia. If we try and enforce a no-fly zone or indeed bomb those heavy weapons, we're going to war with Russia. So it does mean war with Russia. I mean, we might um, assert that this is war with Russia in Ukraine only, and there would be an interest in both sides in, in containing that, but... Of course there's war with Russia, oh boy. Don't you fancy a good nuclear winter, yes? Christ, like how they just casually talk about, you know, entering a conflict with a nuclear power. Yes, of course there's war with Russia. <laughs> Christ if Almighty! Think back to um, Bosnia in the 1990s. It, it wasn't governments that, that decided something had to be done. It was public opinion asserting that they could not put up with this on the television screens every night. But this is a nuclear armed country, which yes, has this. indeed threatened nuclear force and put its nuclear forces on heightened alert just in the past 24 hours. Yes, it is, and so um, this is going to be a really tough test, but. Um, the choice I think we're going to have to face, if, if the Russian military doesn't hold back, is we can either watch the slaughter of tens of thousands of Ukrainian citizens, or we're going to have to find ways to do something about it that are more urgent and decisive than, than sanctions. I don't know. Incredible, right? Incredible. And I love the, the, the reaction from the hosts. Like, I'm fascinated you say that. Oh, yes, I just creamed my pants out, boy. I love a good no-fly zone. And over here, you have uh, Senator Roger Wicker calling for a no-fly zone over Ukraine, right? So he's, uh, uh, he's representing Mississippi. And he endorsed the idea of creating a no-fly zone over Ukraine. And he says, clearly in the absence of a UN resolution, which Russia would veto, a strong coalition of like-minded nations should step in and seriously consider this. Right, so do you see the language that they always use? It's not like, uh, it's not legal. He's saying that even if the UN doesn't sanction it and it's completely illegal, 
We should enforce a no-fly zone with like-minded nations. Rules-based international order, international norms. They say these things that make you think they're talking about international law, but they're not. They're absolutely not. They're, it, it's really interesting, because if you just read between the lines, you just look at the words they're saying, you can tell immediately uh, <laughs> what and who they are. So, a no-fly zone would require implementation by the U.S. military. It would essentially mean the U.S. military would be shooting down planes, Russian planes. And that's Jen Psaki, the White House spokesperson, uh, who, who had to explain that to these journalists. I told you, they're, they're, you know, they're foaming at the mouth. They can't wait to go to war with Russia. And again, I invite them. Go ahead. They're asking for foreign fighters. Be my guest. Right? Be my guest. Will we see you at the front line? I doubt it. I doubt the news desk uh, warmongers will be anywhere near the front line, and especially not in, in uniform and fighting. So it's, it's incredible that you have the governments, the NATO governments, telling these warmongers, like, you need to calm down. <laughs> wow. Wow. Here's... This is a tweet saying BBC Radio 4 presenters are pushing relentlessly for a no-fly zone in Ukraine. Do these simpletons have any idea what would that mean? You see, it's not just an American thing. It's also in Western media in general, in the UK as well. They really, really want war. Right? It's good for their careers. They love it. Let me show you this uh, video over here. Uh, you have a Ukrainian activist speaking to Bro uh, British PM Boris Johnson. Look what she says. A woman. Uh, from uh, my team is now in Bila Tserkva and she is there with two kids and uh, Russian military is over there and she is so much afraid that she will be shot. Kharkiv, the city where I was studying, was bombarded today, fully, the downtown square. So you are talking about the stoicism of Ukrainian people, but Ukrainian women and Ukrainian children are in deep fear because of bombs and missiles which are going from the sky. And Ukrainian people are desperately asking for the West to protect our sky. We are asking for the no-fly zone. We are saying in response that it will trigger World War III. But what is the alternative, Mr. Prime Minister? To observe how our children are, instead of, mis instead of uh, planes, are protecting NATO from the missiles and bombs? What's the alternative for the no-fly zone? We have planes here, we have air defense system in Poland, in Romania. NATO has this air defense. At least this air defense could shield the Western Ukraine so that these children with women could come to the border. It's impossible now to right. cross the border. There are 30 kilometers of lines. Imagine. Okay, so already uh, that's a lie. She's saying that it's impossible to get out. If you look at this tweet over here um, about Senator Romney saying that the no fly zone would help. Uh, people flee, right? Allow refugees to escape. I was just talking with Pepe Escobar how today Russia has been telling people you need to get out of Kiev, out of the capital, and there is a designated corridor, a human corridor for, for, uh, for people to get out of, for refugees to leave, right? I don't remember the exact name of the highway, but they've made one, and this is something they would do in Syria as well. They would warn people before an offensive, there's, there's a humanitarian corridor here, get out, because we're going to uh, take military action against the city, whatever it may be, a raid, a bombing, doesn't matter. But there is a means to get out, and they are they're saying they're acting like it's not true, uh, and that it doesn't exist. It does exist. They, they, they specifically did that. And, you know. Imagine crossing the border with a baby, or with two children. I'm so glad that Samantha Power is coming here to the border from ah. the Polish side. Let her come to the border from Ukrainian side. Samantha Powers, God. I see that. Britain guaranteed our security under Budapest Memorandum. So you're coming to Poland. You're not coming to Kiev, Prime Minister. You're not coming to Lviv. Because you are afraid. Because NATO is not willing to defend. Because NATO is afraid of World War III. But it is already started. And these are Ukrainian children who are there taking the hit. You're talking about more sanctions, Prime Minister. But Roman Abramovich is not sanctioned. He's in London. His children are not in the bombardments. His children are there in London. Putin's children are in Netherlands, in Germany, in mansions. Where are all these mansions seized? I don't see that. Oh, yeah. You know, obviously, the most potent anti-aircraft weapon is seizing mansions. <laughs> 
you know, Putin is going to be, oh, man, they took my house. All right, just land the jets. Stop the air offensive. <laughs> what the fuck does that even mean? Jesus Christ. Maybe you shouldn't take, uh, you know, military advice from someone who thinks that seizing mansions is going to stop a war. You're, you're really out of it. Christ almighty. It's like, why won't you start World War III? You know? Come on. It's not like there's any bad consequences. It's just a war with Russia. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if you're saying that the situation is bad, and I, I don't doubt that people are suffering. They most certainly are. And you know whose fault that is. Why would you want to make it worse? What, you, you want all of Europe, the entire planet, to die? I mean, I don't understand this. Uh, the easy way to stop the bombing is to forswear NATO membership. There is a way. Yeah, she's right. There, there is a way to stop this whole offensive, to stop all of this. It's make sure that NATO stops expanding. I really don't know why, you know, they, they say Russia doesn't want to engage in diplomacy, but there is a diplomatic solution. It's right there. I just said it to you. Stop expanding NATO. And it's not just a demand. NATO promised this. So Russia, it's not like Russia is just, you know, pulling this out of thin air and making demands, imposing demands. No, no, no. The, man, man, you need to, I can't believe I have to explain this. When they were reuniting Germany, when you had talks over German re re reunification in 1990, uh, they made the Russians made it very, very clear that they would only support German reunification if they didn't expand NATO anymore, right? And they were promised not an inch further, not an inch to the east, and that turned out to be a flat lie, flat, flat out lie, complete lie. So it's not like Russia's making this up. There was a promise, and they they went back on it. They reneged and uh, didn't hold up their end of the deal. And so that is the diplomatic solution. That that is the diplomatic solution. You may not like it, but that's the one. Because we don't want war, no one wants war, and diplomacy is the alternative. What, what other alternative is there except diplomacy? That is the diplomatic solution. But the West, they're liars, they never hold up their end of the deal, they want to antagonize Russia, they, they're bullies. That's what we do, the UK, the US, and uh, unfortunately, people are paying for that now, and they're in Ukraine. The Ukrainians are paying for that. And these people want to expand it even more, I mean, they're crazy, they've lost it, you know? Um, let me show you some other examples of, you know, really bright people who think that uh, bombing Russia uh, or shooting down its jets is going uh, <laughs> is gonna end well. So I already told you about Roger Wicker, right? Uh, how about this little, uh, <sighs> this special one over here. Adam Kinsinger, right? So again, he's saying that uh, the fate of Ukraine is being decided tonight, but also the fate of the West. Declare a no-fly zone over Ukraine. He's saying this already a few days ago on February 26th. Declare a no-fly zone over Ukraine at the invitation of their sovereign government. Disrupt Russia's air ops to give the heroic Ukrainians a fair fight. It's now or later. So again, more people who think that, uh, you know, Shooting down Russians is, is going to end well. Lizeya uh, Vasilenko saying, I'm an MP from the opposition. Today I am proud that we have Zelensky as our president. He stands with the people and stands with the army. President of the United States, Joe Biden, please stop offering flights out to our president and give him a no-fly zone and ammo. Because they're complaining that, you know, uh, the United States is, is just saying, come on, leave the country, we'll give you a safe, uh, uh, give you safe passage. But that they don't want that. They don't want to leave Ukraine. They want the United States to come and impose a no-fly zone. Do I need to remind you what happened the last time that there was a no-fly zone? Hmm? Here, here's a very well-articulated tweet from Paul Watson. He says, remember when NATO imposed a no-fly zone over Libya? I do. It led to the destruction of Libya, the rise of ISIS, the Paris massacre, the global migrant crisis, and all that would be a walk in the park compared to what would happen if one were imposed over Ukraine. 100, 120% correct. 120% correct. I, every single point, right? Uh, and I just, I'm, I'm angry. I'm really angry that people, they ignore, it's not even history, it's, it's literally a few years ago, it's, it's, it's contemporary events. And they act like it's a piece of cake and that this is just a question of you having the will to do it. No, it's not about that. It's that Western intervention 
always leads to bigger disasters. Uh, and when, they, when NATO did that in Libya, that country has never recovered since, right? It's been 10 years now, actually 11 years. Hasn't recovered. It's in tatters. Completely destroyed. There's no democracy. Uh, the economy's ruined. Uh, there's no stability. They couldn't even get the elections done. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Not one of those fake promises they made has been fulfilled. And on top of that, it, they, they have left the country in a worse state than it used to be. You know, Af Africa, uh, Libya was Africa's number one uh, um, country in terms of, you know, living standards and uh, in terms of riches. I mean, it, it really went, Gaddafi took that country from being a former colony to the most, well, the wealthiest African country, the, the, one of the most stable African countries. You know, he did extremely great things like the great man-made river, bringing irrigation, water to 70% of Libya, uh, even though most of it is desert. Uh, he, he took the literacy rate up, God knows, what was it, up to 80%, I think? Uh, for, forgive me, I don't have the exact figure with me. I did a whole video on Libya, it's on the channel if you want to go watch it. I, I outlined all these things um, a few months ago. And so, uh, he did so much good for the country, and then they, they paint him as some kind of devil, and get rid of him, but it's not about that. They, the goal of getting rid of Gaddafi was getting the gold and stopping him from undermining French and American monetary hegemony. And my point is, going back to the no-fly zone, that this tweet over here encapsulates uh, so succinctly and, and uh, completely and wholly the consequences of what it means to impose a NATO no-fly zone. And if you think that Libya was bad, and it was, Wait till you see the consequences of a no-fly zone in Ukraine. Man, people are going to be fucking wishing uh, that, it, that uh, it, it was uh, only like Libya. You have no clue what's, what awaits. You have no clue. And the people calling for this are disgusting warmongers, and the majority of them, I, I mean, I understand. Look, I, don't get me wrong. I understand. I understand this activist over here, this woman who's speaking with Boris Johnson. I get it. I get it. She, she's, you know, she's upset. I really get it. But I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about mostly the journalists and, you know, so-called journalists, the reporters, people in media who really just genuinely like war because they think it's good for ratings. They think it's good for their careers. They think that it's good to, you know, it, it, I mean, you know, how much, you know how much money the military industrial complex makes, right? Uh, and you know how much corporate media makes. When there's a war and there's 24-7 coverage about this, and uh, their ratings go up and they make even more money from advertising. So it's not just the military industrial complex making money. Never forget that the corporate media also make a lot from this. And you don't even have to pay these stenographers anything to say this shit because they actually genuinely believe it and genuinely like war. So that's what's shocking is that it's coming from places like the BBC, right? Uh, that it, it's coming from places like uh, NBC. This is who these people are, these so-called reporters. They love war, and they are completely reckless and, and morons, absolute morons. Let me show you a tweet over here from uh, uh, Labour MP, Zara Sultana. She says that a no-fly zone in Ukraine would entail war between two nuclear-armed superpowers. That could easily mean Armageddon. That is why Boris Johnson is right to rule it out. Pundits, desperate to appear tough, should stop irresponsibly agitating for this dangerous move. So that's, that's extremely sensible. That is extremely sensible and correct. Here's uh, a tweet from Chris Murphy, right? He says that there's been a lot of loose talk from smart people about closed air support and no-fly zones for Ukraine. Let's just be clear what that is. The US and Russia at war. It's a bad idea and Congress would never authorize it. And then, of course, underneath, he says that uh, sending military equipment to Ukraine and humanitarian support and crippling sanctions on Russia, these are all the right moves. I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not going to compare uh, uh, every single uh, uh, UK and, 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 and US uh, uh, politician, but you can see that, th that there is, ironically, some common sense coming from NATO governments, despite all the other stuff. I mean, what do they say? Even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? So... It's just, again, so emblematic that the actual uh, uh, warmongers in this case are really coming from the, uh, the media sector. And then, uh, at the same time, though, they, the people who are saying, the people in government like Boris Johnson or Biden who are saying no-fly zone, uh, sorry, no-no-fly zone, they're against it, um, 
they are at the same time provoking Russia in other ways, you know, with the economic sanctions, which are akin to war. Never forget that. Take a look at this. This is an interview uh, from a few days ago, right? There's a Ukrainian woman who gets interviewed uh, on French TV. And, uh, well, I can just say uh, that, uh, just to put it mildly, they didn't really like her answers. Shall we put it that way? On est en, en ligne avec euh, Victoria. Vous êtes ukrainienne, vous avez vécu euh, 25 ans là-bas et je crois euh, comprendre que vous êtes en contact avec votre famille euh, qui vivait à Kiev et qui a fui. Euh, C'est bien ça euh, Pas tout à fait, non. Elle n'a ah. pas fui du tout. <rire> alors racontez-nous, alors quelle est votre situation Je précise un petit peu aussi, euh, j'y reviens depuis 4 jours en fait de l'Ukraine. Euh, bon, personne n'y croyait, ça c'est clair, euh, dans ces événements-là. Alors, pour narrer un petit peu, parce qu'on dit un petit peu beaucoup de choses, exode, ceci, cela, pour narrer un petit peu le problème euh, qui, qui nous concerne, c'est que euh, le conflit dure depuis 2014, ça on le sait. Il s'agit quand même de la population ukrainienne qui est martyrisée au quotidien, euh, 2, 000, euh, 2 millions de personnes. Euh, voilà. Euh, que les problèmes de chauffage, euh, c'est l'hiver, euh, sont difficiles, le salaire moyen, voilà, vous m'entendez Oui, très bien. Voilà, euh, pour se chauffer actuellement dans ces mois d'hiver, euh, c'est plus de moitié que les ménages doivent consacrer à ça. Euh, donc la vie est très très compliquée, donc euh, je ne vois pas qui est-ce qu'on défend. Euh, le président euh, et le gouvernement fantoche là actuellement, que je trouve fantoche, et pas du tout celui que Poutine soi-disant va mettre. Euh, hum. c est, c est vous, vous, vous parlez Moi, là de... Moi, je suis de... emporté contre hum. tout ce qu'on entend là actuellement, les pauvres Ukrainiens. Mais les pauvres Ukrainiens, ils y sont, euh, avec ces gouvernements successifs, avec cette hum. misère, avec cette économie délabrée. Hum. Elle parle de Zelensky. Hein. Oui, mais vous parlez de Zelensky, vous parlez de qui Vous parlez des... De Zelensky, oui. oui, oui. Zelensky. Donc vous, u... vous, Ukrainienne, vous considérez que Zelensky, le, 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 le chef d'État... Euh, Dûment euh, élu d'Ukraine, de, de, est, est à la tête d'un gouvernement fantoche Fantoche, d'une euh, chose. Et puis la deuxième chose, euh, c'est une personne pas du tout démocratique. Il y a quand même quatre chaînes euh, oppositionnistes qui étaient fermées. Euh, il y a des journalistes qui sont tués. Euh, on décrit ça pour la Russie, mais ça se passe mmh. aussi en Ukraine. Il y a quand même quatre journalistes qui sont tués euh, mmh. euh, depuis quelques années. Mmh. Euh, il y a tas de choses qui se passent euh, qu'on ne sait pas et qu'on ne dit pas. En fait. oui. Donc ce que, ce que vous dites, vous, attendez, attendez, ça m'intéresse. Ce que vous dites, vous, euh, ukrainienne vivant en France et qui revient régulièrement en Ukraine, c'est que finalement les Occidentaux ont une vision un peu idéalisée avec le, le méchant ours russe et le, le gentil, euh, la gentille démocratie euh, ukrainienne. Vous dites que c'est pas si simple que ça. C'est pas si simple. C'est pas tout noir et tout blanc d'un côté ou de l'autre. C'est quand même les Russes qui ont attaqué. Je pense que M. de Cochon a l'air de voir les choses avant d'avoir une Juste une chose, juste une chose. Les proches que vous connaissez qui sont en votre famille. Do you see that? They're like, non, non, mais c'est pas possible tout ça. Non, 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 non. They can't handle it, man. Qui est aujourd'hui. En, en Ukraine, elle, elle, j'imagine qu'elle traverse des heures difficiles et qu'elle est aussi en train de, de fuir ou de se déplacer devant l'avancée des, des troupes ouais, russes. Il reste, il reste à Kiev. Oui, la Attendre fois. sagement, ils étaient empêchés aujourd'hui d'aller au bureau. Euh, ah oui, ça c'est sûr. Ah oui, ah, sûr. Ah, oui, ah, sûr. Ah, parce qu'il y avait des embouteillages, ouais. mais euh, sinon, mmh. ils ils iront demain. C'est la première fois que j'entends qu'un gouvernement démocratiquement élu est un gouvernement euh, fantoche. Enfin, enfin bon, euh, c'est pas, pas, pas contre blanc ou noir. Mais mais enfin, c'est bien, 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 bien la Russie qui a attaqué ce matin. Est-ce ouais, euh, est que ça veut dire qu'il y a aujourd'hui à Kiev? Do you see how like they they want to interview someone Ukrainian to ask them about Ukraine, but as soon as they go off script, they're like talking over her. It's like no, no, no. You you're bad token, bad token. No, <laughs> be quiet. C'est nous les, nous nous les Français, c'est nous qui parlent. La ferme. <rire> Je dis pas dans le Donbass, à Kiev, des Ukrainiens qui sont. Oh, c'est content que les Russes interviennent. C'est ça que je dois comprendre de ce que vous me dites. Absolument. 
Et puis le gouvernement aussi qui est élu euh, démocratiquement, on ne sait pas du tout. Il y a des Ukrainiens aussi qui doutent de véracité de ces élections. Mmh. Bien. C'est ce que je vais dire. Il y a, on, doute de, on doute de beaucoup de choses. Mais il, y a, il faudrait peut-être dire des choses mises au point. Il y a eu une dérive sectaire de ce gouvernement. Moi, je veux bien l'entendre, M. de Kochko, madame. Peut-être y a-t-il eu des dérives sectaires. Peut-être y a-t-il y a eu effectivement, des assassinats de journalistes. Mais je vous rappellerai qu'à Malte, on a aussi assassiné une journaliste. En Bulgarie, on a aussi assassiné des journalistes. Eh bien, ce n'est pas pour autant euh, qu'on euh, va, on va envahir Malte. Pas, on va envahir la, la Bulgarie. Voilà. Hum. Ah, donc, on n'est plus au temps de la Hongrie en 1956. Mais non, mais... La Tchécoslovaquie en 60. Wow, they actually said that. They actually said that. You know, just because you kill a couple of journalists doesn't mean you're not a democracy. Yeah, they do this everywhere, man. <laughs> oh. Oh, 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 my God. La Bulgarie, voilà. Donc on n'est plus au temps de la Hongrie en 1956 ou de la Tchécoslovaquie en 68. Il y a un système judiciaire, peut-être est-il perfectible, mais rien ne peut venir justifier. Non, mais personne ne justifie, vous ne devez rien dire. Personne ne justifie. Non, non, ce soir, il y a beaucoup. Yeah, well, I wonder if they'd say the same thing about Russia. Well, you know, of course Putin's killed a couple of journalists. That's, everyone does that. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. doesn't mean it's not democratic. <laughs> I bet you they wouldn't say that shit. Oh, man, this is, wow. This is amazing. And they say, you know, the judiciary isn't perfect. doesn't mean it's not a democracy. Really, say the same thing about Russia. I dare you. <rire> un système judiciaire peut-être est-il perfectible, mais rien ne peut venir justifier. Non, non, mais personne ne justifie, vous ne devez rien dire. Personne ne justifie. Non, non, ce soir, il y a beaucoup d'émoi et d'émotion parce que des gens sont morts euh, en, en Ukraine. Alors, et dans le Donbass. Euh, voilà, donc, et, on, on, et dans le Donbass, si vous voulez, partout. Ouais. Voilà, et que. Il dit que les gens en Ukraine. Oui, et je pense que dans le Donbass, vous savez. What do you mean, I guess so, si vous voulez, je sais pas si, si on veut, c'est un fait, c'est un fait, ils sont morts, ils se sont fait tuer là-bas, si vous voulez, attends mais... <rire> Et que c'est difficile pour les gens d'entendre, euh, finalement, euh, ce système ukrainien, il n'était pas parfait, il était corrompu, et on tuait aussi des journalistes, etc. Sous-entendu, tant mieux. Donc, euh, oui. On ne voit pas devenir avec ce gouvernement-là actuel en Ukraine, mmh. Mmh. au niveau économique, eh ben, au niveau social. On renverse le gouvernement après un gouvernement démocratique. Oui, mmh. enfin, là, où, là oui, le, le truc, c'est qu'effectivement, comme dit Patrick Martin-Génier, si on n'est pas satisfait, on renverse le gouvernement par des biais d'élections, ouais. mais on n'a pas besoin. De... <rire> oh, yeah! You remember when, when the French uh, overthrew uh, their uh, government democratically during the French Revolution? <laughs> They chopped off the heads democratically. They, they guillotined the ruling class democratically. <laughs> God, this is so funny. Oui, enfin, là, où, là oui, le, le truc, c'est qu'effectivement, comme dit Patrick Martin, si on n'est pas satisfait, on renverse le gouvernement par des Putain, vous êtes malade. Mais on n'a pas besoin d'une invasion russe. Pour, pour changer les choses. Mais, merci, non, Victoria. Mais, mais, en général. En février 2014, Alors, contre putain, le vous êtes malade. Ouais. Rappelez-vous de ça quand même. Comment en février 2014, il y a eu un coup d'État contre un, un président élu. Ouais. Ah, oh, ça c'était énorme, c'était génial ça, putain. <rire> Et à la fin, c'est comme, mais vous savez qu'il y a eu un coup en 2014, right? Uh. Don't you care about that? Oh, that cuts. Cut off. Ouais, bon, écoute ça. Ah, écoute, hein, c'est comme ça, mon gars. Écoute, écoute on n'est pas parfait. Il n'y a personne qui est parfait. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. I mean, do you, do you understand why... <laughs> do you understand why people look at this shit and they're like, like that's state media. I mean, you call it free, but that's fucking state media. You, you sound like, you know, l'Elysée, which is, you know, France's Kremlin. Um, or White House. Putain, c'était énorme, ça. Ah non, j'ai vraiment, vraiment, euh, vraiment kiffé. Merci. <laughs> you guys need to send me more of this stuff. That was fucking hilarious. That was hilarious. I love that. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's really a nice unmasking, right? It's a great unmasking. Um, this is the same thing that happens with Syrians uh, who, you know, you, you, I've seen this before, man. Like, they get asked about Bashar al-Assad or about the government, and as soon as they go off script, they're like, oh no, but, you know, surely uh, you can't be saying that uh, everything I've been taught is nonsense, can you? That wouldn't be right. <laughs> and then they just dismiss you. It's, it's really just, 
they're just trying to use people as a token, as a Syrian token, Ukrainian token, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's the same playbook. Wow, wow, c'était bien ça, putain. <laughs> You know what's funny is because when they do want to do a coup, like, or they invade another country, they're more than happy to to point to the judiciary being corrupt, to journalists being killed. Like, again, when it's when it's uh, favorable to our situation and our agenda, then we want these criticisms. But when it's not, well, come on, like, just because they're killing some journalists doesn't mean you do a coup. Come on. <laughs> 